Well, good morning, Chapel family and friends. We're uh, so glad to see you this morning. I'm um, so glad to have you. My name is JP, and um, I just want to welcome both uh, everybody here in person as well as online. We are having a few technical difficulties with the internet. I think it's kind of spread all over the Northeast, so those online will watch this a little bit later. Um, but again, we're so glad you came out with us to uh, worship in person and uh, to hear God's word. I only have two announcements this morning, but they are two good ones. So the first one is we are getting ready to kick off the men's uh, Bible studies, uh, Bible study, men and the minor prophets. And that starts September 8th on a Tuesday. And it's going to be both a hybrid version where we're going to meet in person and online. So that includes a big group of people that can join us in that. We'll be tracking along the new sermon series uh, that Pastor Duncan's going to be teach teaching, Excuse me, but we'll be going into more depth uh, with it. So we hope you can join it, register online, and sign up for that. The other one is that we have four women's studies. We're very excited about this, and I know we're going through like difficult times, but we're super excited that we can keep the ministries going, we can keep people connected in groups, and so there'll be four studies starting very, very soon in different areas. We really think God has something for each one of you, um, and that uh, there are great opportunities here to fellowship with women. So you can register online um, as well as through our weekly email, so we invite you to do that as well. Um, and that's, uh, the starting dates for that will, will vary as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and then we'll get going with the services, if you want, um, can join me. Lord, we are gathered here to worship and to praise you, Lord, with all our hearts and all our soul and all our strength. We pray to enter a time um, with you in your presence, um, where we hear your word, where you stir us and move us, Lord, um, to just respond to who you are. And so we're thankful um, through our worship and through Josh teaching this morning that, Lord, you will teach us, that you will bring us um, not just into your presence, but to reveal your word in a new way. And so we pray for that, Lord, and um, it's, it's only through you, Lord. You sustain us and you carry us. And so we give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Your love is great. 
shout it out We're alive cause you're alive And what a love we found Death can't hold a sound We shout it out We're alive cause you're alive And what a love we found Death can't hold a sound We shout it out We're alive cause you're alive And what a love we found Death can't hold a sound We shout it out, we're alive cause you're alive. This is such a church thing to say, but let's give a clap offering to the Lord. That means that we're saying, God, we welcome you. Lord, we worship you despite our circumstances. Despite everything, God, we just give it all to you. Everyone needs compassion, God that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave
glorified today. May we praise you in joy and happiness and faith and trusting you. 
thank you for your presence. Thank you for these people. And uh, God, just be glorified today and speak to us. Amen. You can have a seat. And if you will, turn your attention up to the screen where we're going to be watching a video from Work Camp. Woohoo! It's a week of serving um, your residents and just a time for growth, really. I always grow so much for the weeks, and I learn so much about myself, and I learn so much about what God is just speaking, speaking through me. Work camp is, I think, is a lot more reflective than other camps, and you really get to switch around and <laughs> see how actually going out and living for God is rather than going to camp and then coming home and being different. You really are in the camp, and you're going out and doing stuff already. It's really important to me because it's definitely made me more uh, outgoing and stuff because you, you, you're on a cruise site with people you don't know and you meet residents that maybe uh, may be strange to you or something and you just, you have to be a little more outgoing and do stuff that you normally wouldn't do like climbing up ladders or going on the roof. It was really nice just to be able to get a week away for a week with um, other Christians. It was just like a nice atmosphere to be under. It was a nice change of pace, especially with uh, the pandemic and all. My favorite part about work camp was that I connected with the crew member from I was able to share something personal that has been on my heart for a while. She was able to identify with me and encourage me. Work camp not only gave us a chance to serve others, but to develop Christian relationships on a deeper level. I can be real and honest about the problems I deal with without having to pretend that everything is okay. My favorite part about work camp is getting to uh, meet people from other churches and work together um, to see the before and after of the project that you work together to complete and just um, getting to help somebody that um, otherwise might not have been able to, to afford the job that you get to do for them. And thank you for leading worship, and uh, thank you, Caleb, for making that video and doing all the drone work and all that stuff. So thank you guys so much. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of work went behind on behind the scenes. So, uh, so my name is Josh King. I'm the director of student ministries here. I get to preach again this morning. So, uh, and so I'm excited. So. Uh, 
to start off, I wanted us to go through a little exercise and experience something a little fun. When I was a, a kid, I used to go to the library and actually look at physical books. It was a good time. Um, but uh, one of the books, uh, there's a whole section. We used to take, um, get this book, and you would open it up to a page, and it was a, an image of something really zoomed in. And then you had to turn the page, um, and then you would see it zoomed out. So you had to guess what it was, guess what the object was when it was all zoomed in. And so we're going to uh, be going uh, through this right now. So uh, the first one here, what do you guys think this is? Kind of starting off, they're listed alphabetically here, so it gets a little tricky. But this one, this one's a little hard. I thought it was a car at first, but, but, but if you zoom out, it's actually a Coke bottle. So, ooh. Uh, so the next one, I originally thought it was like a burrito, but it's not a burrito. I'll give you a hint. It is somewhat food related. Uh, if you zoom out, it's actually uh, a piece of gum. So this one I think you might be able to get. So the next one here. So it's like brown or black stuff at the top and the bottom and white stuff in the middle. Oreo, yes, I heard an Oreo. So uh, this next one uh, is not food related. I suppose you could eat it, but I wouldn't recommend it. I thought it was orange. Oh, I heard a pencil somewhere, yeah. So it is a pencil, good job. I would not recommend eating the pencil. Uh, the next one is, it's, it's, it's impossible, but it looks kind of cool zoomed out. Uh, so if you zoom out, it's actually a, a sponge. So, uh, The next one is, I'll give you a hint, it is food related. I'm not sure if I heard it there, but it's a tomato. <laughs> and this next one uh, is, uh, I think, the easiest one. After you eat all this food, you have to brush your teeth with a toothbrush. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so uh, the reason that we, I went through that exercise is that sometimes when we, when we read the Bible, uh, it's really just like we were so zoomed in, and all we read is like one quick little verse, uh, and we don't understand that verse because of the overall context, um, and we don't get the overall uh, meaning of the verse, and sometimes that's really important. So this is a very extreme example, but uh, one time I saw this verse listed on a Christian motivational calendar. So every single day you would get like a, an encouraging little Bible verse. And so I forgot what day it was. It probably was like Friday the 13th or something like that. Uh, it was a Luke 4, 7, and so here's the verse. It said, if you worship me, it will all be yours. <laughs> so this was actually in a calendar. And so what, what exactly are you supposed to read? How are you supposed to understand that? Um, like, what does it mean? Who is speaking here? Is it God speaking? Uh, if so, then we worship God and then we get whatever we want. That sounds a little bit off. Uh, but if we zoom out and get the whole meaning of that, that verse in that section, it's from Luke 4, 5 through 8. And here it is. Uh, the devil led Jesus up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. The devil said to Jesus, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. <laughs> Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God, God and serve him only. Uh, so it turns out that that little snippet has a completely different meaning. Um, like the devil is trying to tempt Jesus and get Jesus to betray God. And so that is not something you want on a motivational calendar. <laughs> um, and so the verse that we're going to really look into uh, today is uh, Luke uh, 10, 20. Um, and so we're going to zoom out and look at that whole verse in context. So it's not going to be as dramatic of a switch or anything like that. Like the meaning isn't going to switch like that first verse. Uh, but uh, hopefully um, the Holy Spirit lets us understand that verse in a much deeper way. Uh, and that's really impactful. Uh, but before we dive in, I just wanted to pray uh, like we always do. Jesus, thank you so much that we get to gather here. Thank you for um, all the work uh, went on behind the scenes. I pray, um, Holy Spirit, speak through the Bible, speak through me. If, uh, if the words are from you, may they just penetrate our hearts and may we remember them and may they change us. Um, but if they're just from me, may they hit the floor uh, and may they be forgotten. And if I forget anything, uh, use the conversations afterwards, use uh, this, the Bible reading itself. Uh, just speak whatever you want to be spoken today in your name. Amen. So the verse today uh, is Luke 10, 20, uh, B. It says this, uh, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Uh, I really love this verse. Uh, it's the second half of uh, the verse, Luke 10, 20. So uh, for those of you maybe newer to reading the Bible, that letter B means it's like the second half of the verse. 
Also, the three dots that I put at the beginning of it, um, that uh, represents uh, an ellipsis, so it's like there's a whole second half to that verse, but I just really wanted to focus on that first half right now. Anyway, uh, this uh, verse is one of my favorites, uh, especially after finishing work camp like we did two weeks ago. Um, and any big event like that where you're like kind of working hard and you're putting your, all your work and energy into it. Um, this verse is really important after a time like that. Um, uh, and like the, the meaning of, of this verse is really pretty clear. Uh, when we are saved, um, this makes us rejoice. Uh, when all the bad things that we have done are forgiven, this just makes us happy. Um, and this meaning isn't going to change, but we are going to understand that in a much deeper way. And so let's zoom out a little bit, uh, and let's read all of verse 20. So this is Luke uh, 10, 20. However, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Uh, so we have uh, the first part of that verse, uh, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Okay, that's interesting. If I just read that out of context, I'd be like, that's, didn't really see that one coming. Um, so what is going on here? What's, what are all some of those details? We'll look more at that uh, soon. Um, but for now, I, I do want to say uh, just a way of restating that verse in kind of everyday language. I would say uh, we should rejoice more because we are saved and then in the, just because we get to do cool things, just because uh, there are fun things that God wants us to do. And in this case, uh, it is uh, the spirits submitting to us. Uh, it's not that we should be sad because we, we get to do cool things for God like work camp. It's just that in comparison, us being saved and being forgiven and knowing God, um, that should come in first place. Everything else should come in, to, in second place. Um, so what exactly is going on here? We have this whole idea of spirit submitting to people. Uh, who is speaking? So let's zoom out again. Uh, let's look at Luke 10, 17 through 20. So it's just, this is that one little paragraph. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Uh, he said to them, Jesus said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing at all will harm you. However, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So we have a bunch more information there. So there are 72 people uh, returning from some sort of mission. Um, they all all really happy. And they took part in some kind of serious stuff. Uh, so it, it, from our kind of American Western culture, um, they're talking about spiritual warfare, and it's okay to be honest about that stuff and say, hey, that's really weird from, for my American ears. Um, and we usually, we do talk about good and evil a lot, especially if you watch the news. We talk a lot about what is good and what is bad, good and evil, uh, but we don't talk a lot about kind of like the spiritual dimension behind the scenes, angels and demons, um, anything that we can't kind of physically touch and experience with our five sen senses, we kind of, I don't know, we just have trouble grasping that. Uh, but to be clear, uh, a complete Christian worldview does believe in angels and demons and this guy named Satan. Um, and not that we think that every single, every single bad thing is caused um, by, like, by Satan doing something bad or anything like that. And I'm not saying that science has no place. Like, obviously, like, my wife is a nurse. I was a paramedic. Like, we love science. We love medicine. Um, but what I am saying is that a complete worldview has all of those things together. Uh, and especially in this verse right here, they're talking about that spiritual dimension. They're talking about angels and demons and all that stuff that's kind of hard for us to, to understand. And in this verse, uh, we have, uh, and also all through the Bible, we have Satan. Um, he's represented by the image of a snake. Um, and also all through the Bible, we have um, uh, when the Bible talks about scorpions, this is from one of my commentaries, uh, scorpions can be used as a metaphor for human obstacles to one's call. Um, and so the issues that pop, us, pop up that try to stop us, uh, that's a scorpion. So uh, if anyone has been to work camp, you're, you're used to dealing with scorpions. You have like a board that doesn't fit right, so you have to recut it or get a hammer or you run out of supplies. Or, or you don't have the right tool, something gets in the way. Like this morning when there was a massive internet outage in the whole northeast of America, like that's a big scorpion that we have to kind of figure out how to work through. Um, 
Also, too, the coronavirus uh, is one big, <laughs> one big scorpion, especially for work camp. We had, to work, we had to really work and figure out all those details. How can we have work camp in a safe way? Uh, but we did it. I, think, I do think it's important to mention that we, we crushed that scorpion. We, it's been two weeks, and we've had zero people sick, and so that, is, that's, that deserves a wahoo. So. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, really, I mean, I remember so many different times. We're like, how can we do this? How can we do this? But we, we didn't give up, and we figured it out. So um, anyway, so we have those ideas, um, the spiritual warfare stuff leading up to today's main verse, um, and it's spoken by Jesus. Uh, so everything so far, if I had to put it in my own words, I would say something like, angels and demons are real, uh, but Satan can't stop us from being saved. There's this spiritual dimension, but Satan cannot stop us from being saved. Like, that's, that's God's business. Um, and so let's zoom out even more. Uh, we're going to look at the mission, of the, seven, the mission of the 72 and what they went on and all the things that they experienced. And so this is a larger section. It's Luke 9.51 through 10.24. I know it's, it's long, um, uh, but I really think it's important for us to read the entire thing. So I'll, I'll stop in a couple different sections here, and it won't be too long. So my sermon's only like an hour and a half, so I timed it, so no big deal. But uh, no, well, I think it's really important, especially as we, as we learn to read the Bible. This is how the Bible was written. Um, like, you, you're supposed to read it all in one chunk or big chunks and stuff like that. It's kind of like watching a movie. Like, who watches a movie in, like, 30-second snippets? Like, you're supposed to go and see, like, a movie and sit down in a movie theater and experience the entire thing. You get so much deeper meaning here. So, so as we're reading this, uh, I want you to ask, ask yourself this question. How did these stories all build up to the verse today? How do they help me understand what's going on here? How do they add value in a deeper way? Uh, so let's read uh, Luke 9, 51 through 10, 24. Uh, when the days were coming to a close for him, for Jesus to be taken up, uh, he determined to journey to Jerusalem. And so we're going to stop this really quick. Uh, this first verse is incredibly important. Uh, so Jesus determined to journey to Jerusalem. This is a, a dramatic turn in the story. Uh, I, I think of when I was uh, back working as a paramedic in the ambulance, um, and I was in the back, and we're going lights and sirens, and I'm taking care of my patient. Uh, sometimes I, w I would wear my seatbelt, but a lot of times you couldn't wear your seatbelt in the back because uh, you had to be able to move around and, and to get into cabinets and use different radios and all that stuff. When the driver would make a dramatic turn or slam on his brakes, what do you think happened to me? Like, I would go slamming against the walls and stuff like that. Um, from what I remember, it only happened three times, but it might have happened more, but I remember a couple different times getting slammed and landing in the wheel well and then having to get back up. And <laughs> so uh, when I think of Jesus turning to Jerusalem, it's just jarring. It's, it's a dramatic thing because I think the people knew, as, but especially Jesus knew, he was heading to Jerusalem to die on the cross. He was determined, uh, and this was, this was a thing, and people were a little scared. People got kind of rocked a little bit when he made a, made a direct turn, and especially as you're reading the, the entire book of Luke, like this is a dramatic turn in the story. Um, so the second verse here, so he sent messengers ahead of himself, and on the way uh, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him, but they did not welcome him because he determined to journey to Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? It seems a little intense to me, but whatever. Uh, he turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. Um, so the trip that Jesus started was actually a pretty long one. Uh, it would have taken several days. Uh, so I've always wanted to do this. Um, to help me understand this, I looked up some maps. Uh, so here is a map of, uh, of Jesus' time. So he is from the north, uh, the area of Galilee. They have to travel through Samaria. So the Samar uh, Samaritans and uh, the Jewish people didn't really like each other, but he had to travel through their land all the way down uh, to Jerusalem, the capital city. And so using Google Maps, I actually figured out how long it would take to walk. So this is a similar walk, like walking from Westfield uh, to Boston. <laughs> it would take around 35 hours of walking, and it's just over 100 miles. Uh, and here's a Google map of uh, Israel to compare. So it's about 35 hours. Um, it's interesting, uh, in this thing in Israel, it's actually all uphill too, which is, that's not the case in Massachusetts. But So it would have taken a long time. It was, again, it was a dramatic, Jesus, like, he had to be determined to do this. It wasn't just like, oh yeah, I'll walk to 7-Eleven or something like that. Like, he really had to go for it. 
And so, and they're having trouble places to stay along the road. Um, again, we don't have time to dive into it here, but they, they were having trouble for trouble to find places to stay. Um, and too bad they didn't have like Google Maps or Airbnb. It would have been a lot easier. Anyway, as they were traveling along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told them, foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. Lord, he said, first let me go bury my father. But he told them, let the bed, dead bury their own dead. Uh, but you go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to those in my house. But Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And so in this section, Jesus is traveling and people come up to him or he goes to other people. And he has, these are some kind of snippets, but these are intense interactions here. Uh, and some of Jesus' words seem pretty harsh, uh, especially I think it's important to kind of talk about when some guy goes up to Jesus and says, hey, let me bury my father. Uh, and Jesus says like, no, like, like, hey, Jesus, I thought you were supposed to be a nice guy. Like, that seems like a very reasonable request. Um, looking through uh, the history and the culture of that time, I think maybe a better way of saying it, uh, well, uh, no, comment, no commenter believes that the person's father just died and he had to bury him. What they really think is saying is that he either died and the whole burial process takes over a year, uh, but most likely what he's saying is he goes up to Jesus and says, I will follow you, but, but I want my father to pass away first, and then that whole process takes a year to bury him, and then once I receive my inheritance, then I will follow you. So it's really this kind of long, drawn-out process and, um, and Jesus sees through that. Um, he, like he, I think he sees through that. And I'm not saying that we necessarily have this power, but Jesus sees through that. And it's, ultimately, it's an excuse. That man is trusting his inheritance, his wealth. He's trying to determine his own timeline. But Jesus essentially is saying, no, it's me first. Like, I have to be your top priority. And uh, anything else uh, that goes into first place, that's not all right. Ultimately, it's an excuse. And so after those interactions, uh, we continue on. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. Uh, he sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself was about to go. He told them, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. That's a great verse there. Uh, Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't carry a money bag, traveling bag, or sandals. Don't greet anyone along the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this household. If a person of peace is there, rest your peace on him, but if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they offer, for the worker is worthy of his wages. Don't move from house to house. When you enter the town and they welcome you, eat the things they set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. That's so cool. Like, they get to perform miracles. Uh, when you enter any town and they don't welcome you, go out into its streets and say, we are wiping off even the dust of your town that clings to our feet as a witness against you. Know this for certain, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sodom, they would have repented long ago sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted in heaven? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Whew, that was a big part, part to read. Thank, uh, big portion to read. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, but those last few sentences, I think, are really important, and they kind of summarize everything so far. Generally speaking, um, there are two groups of people, uh, those who accept Jesus, uh, accept his messengers, and they accept the good news, and those who do not accept Jesus. Um, and so not that those who reject Jesus are less valuable or less human or anything like that, um, but what we believe matters. Like, we have to make a decision. Who is Jesus? Jesus is either God or he is not. Um, like, you will either make excuses and embrace the truth, or you will either make excuses or you will embrace the truth. And, and in these sections, Jesus is testing people's hearts. He's giving uh, the, those 72, um, like, tools, and that he's equipping them to help kind of um, differentiate those two groups of people. Yeah, because our decisions matter. 
And so this leads us up to the section today. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So I would have been super excited. So I go out, I'm part of this like missions trip and stuff like that. It takes a few days. I get to heal people. If I go back to Jesus and be, hey, I got to heal someone. Like, that's so cool. Like, like I was a paramedic. This is really cool. But what they say is that <laughs> even the demons submit to us. So that shows you kind of how their culture just um, embraced the spiritual reality a lot more. They understood like, what was going on behind the scenes. Uh, he said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing at all will harm you. However, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Yeah, so this is our main verse today. We understand that mission of the 72 more, and we understand all the different interactions that they had along the way. Uh, and we know now that those 72, like Jesus was kind of, um, dividing people into two groups. And those 72 people, they accept Jesus' message. They're messengers, like they're carrying on the message. Uh, and that is something so incredibly cool. Uh, but there's more. So this is, this is after that verse. Um, at the time, at that time, he, Jesus, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and on earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, because this was your good pleasure... All things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one, knew, no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son. Anyone to whom the Son desires, and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal him. Then turning to his disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see the things you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see the things that you see, but didn't see them. To hear the things you hear, uh, but didn't hear them. And so I love this last section. So uh, it says that Jesus is rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. Uh, he is just so incredibly happy. Um, his disciples, his followers are getting it. Uh, they understand who he is. They understand uh, what's going on behind the scenes. They see and hear uh, that Jesus is God's son and they get to do miracles. His followers fall into that second category of people. Um, they are following Jesus, even though it's hard. I mean, he prepped them. <laughs> I'm sending you like lambs among wolves. Like that's, <laughs> like, <laughs> can you imagine if I said that <laughs> before work camp? Yeah, are you guys going to get slaughtered out there? So, but no, but Jesus, I mean, he's equipping them uh, and he's, uh, he has a vision for them. Uh, in a, and in a deeper way, though, Jesus is rejoicing that they are saved, that they get it. Um, and so some of the commentaries that I read, um, I have, there was a gift from my seminary. We got, we got all these kind of fancy commentaries and stuff like that. Uh, and some of them, they really dive into the original languages. Uh, but honestly, I'm not smart enough to read the original languages. Uh, I haven't taken Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic or anything like that. And most of the commentaries I read, anyone can read. They're written in everyday language. Uh, but a lot of these commentaries kept pointing to the original languages, even like the non-technical ones, uh, because um, our English language is kind of missing the point and missing some of the nuance and the important meaning behind these verses, especially in verse 21, uh, 20 and 21. And it's because they thought that it was important to help me understand the Bible. I'm doing the same for you. So we're going to dive a little bit into the uh, original language here. Um, and so when Jesus is rejoicing, uh, that verb is an incredibly expressive verb. So this is actually from one of the dictionaries, one of the Greek dictionaries. Uh, when Jesus is rejoicing, it says this, uh, to experience a state of great joy and gladness, often involving verbal expression and appropriate body movement. <laughs> uh, to be extremely joyful, to be overjoyed, to rejoice greatly. In other portions of the Bible, uh, this verb is translated, I shout because I am so happy. <laughs> that is so cool. Um, but why is Jesus so happy? Why is he so elated? Um, he's, he's happy because his, his followers' names are written in heaven. Um, this is so big. Um, that verb written uh, is incredibly important. So, so bear with me a little bit here. So in the English language, we have at least three tenses. So we have um, like past, present, and future. So like I, I wrote, I write, I will write. So you guys following me here? Um, in the Greek language, they have like a lot more and it gets kind of confusing, but they have this thing called the perfect tense. 
Um, and it's reserved for when the people want to make a point. And when someone uses the perfect tense, when they conjugate a verb in the perfect tense, what they're, what they're really saying is that something is completely and perfectly and 100% done, it's complete. And it dramatically affects you right now in the present. And so that is what is going on. And so Jesus is kind of shifting into this perfect tense. And that word written is written uh, in the perfect tense. So Jesus is saying that our names are perfectly written in the book of life. Our salvation is 100% done. And there's nothing that anyone can do to take that away. And it dramatically affects us right now. They would have understood that. And that, they would have understood that's why Jesus is so happy. Uh, there's another example of when the perfect tense is used. Um, it actually rhymes because they have the same uh, last, uh, the last several letters. Um, it's when Jesus is on the cross and he says, it is finished. Um, that is written in the perfect tense. So when he is dying and all his work is finished, what he's saying is that we are perfectly forgiven. Uh, we are completely forgiven. We are 100% forgiven. And that dramatically affects us right now. Like that would have been built into their language. And the English language simply just doesn't have that. Um, and that causes great rejoicing. And I love um, even reading through some of the different Bible translations. Like they, they, the Bible scholars, they, 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 they see, like they're wrestling with this. So one of uh, a new, newer translation, it's called the Net Bible. Um, this is how they translate it. Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names stand written in heaven. There's like, they're just trying to get at this like deeper meaning. Like, no, like this is a big deal, people. Um, like, I wish you understood Greek, but you don't because you just speak English, which is fine, but the Holy Spirit can work. But man, like, this is such, such a big deal. Um, uh, so I'm not a super expressive person, but I, uh, wahoo is sometimes all I can do. Uh, but when I was reading all this and thinking through this, and I'm thinking of Jesus rejoicing uh, because people's names are written in heaven, um, I just thought of my daughter, Leah. Uh, so she went from a crib uh, to a big girl bed, and so uh, she was ready, and we were all excited and stuff like that. So we, we set it all up, we cleaned her room, and we had her wait outside the hall. And we said, okay, Leah, are you ready to see your big girl bed? Uh, and this is, what, this is what her reaction was. <laughs> is that a big girl bed? <laughs> what? All right, you can put as many people in there as you want. <laughs> Do you like it? <laughs> she liked it, I think so. Um, but Jesus is doing that. He's rejoicing like that. He's having appropriate body movement. <laughs> um, uh, do you rejoice like that because you, uh, your name is written in heaven? Um, Jesus does. Um, I know some of us would kill for uh, someone that we look up to to rejoice over us. Jesus uh, is rejoicing over you. Um, even the Bible says the angels are too. Like there's a party in heaven when we uh, become Christian and we're forgiven and we're made new. There is a party that goes on. Uh, we are perfectly forgiven um, and our names are perfectly written in heaven. And like that is such a big deal and that, that's what causes um, rejoicing. And so really quick, I just want to kind of help us read the Bible a little bit. So zooming out even bigger, a whole theme in Luke and Acts uh, is that Jesus saves the world. So Luke and Acts were, were written by one author. They were just too big to fit on one scroll. Each scroll could only be like 35 feet long, and so they had two scrolls. It's kind of like when back in the day when movies were on DVDs. Like you couldn't fit a, one movie sometimes on one DVD, so we had two DVDs. Um, and so as you're experiencing this big, long work that is Luke and Acts, um, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to think about location. That was a storytelling technique. And so uh, Luke starts, uh, Jesus' ministry starts in Galilee. He goes on this huge trip, and then he ends in Jerusalem. Um, and then Acts uh, starts in Jerusalem and then ends in Rome. And so that might sound like a little bit boring, but they would have understood the significance behind that. Um, that was really important to their storytelling again. And so what they're trying to get at with that is that salvation comes through a Jewish man named Jesus. 
uh, and he died and rose again in Jerusalem, but it doesn't stop there. It goes to the end of the whole world, uh, and Acts ends in Rome, the capital city of the Roman Empire back there, and it uses a, a whole launching point and like a phrase that is repeated a bunch. It talks about uh, where you're supposed to reach the ends of the earth, and it uses Rome as that launching point. Um, because we are saved, we want to tell everyone about Jesus, and that is just that is something that, that should just happen naturally. And as you're reading Luke and Acts, you're supposed to kind of, as you're rejoicing, you're supposed to, as an outflow, uh, share the good news. And then zooming out even bigger, uh, we see Genesis uh, all the way through Revelation. Uh, in the first book of Genesis, when we mentioned this at work camp, uh, there was a promise. So snake, uh, the snake, Satan, uh, he tricked Adam and Eve. Uh, but God promises that that snake will be crushed. And then in Luke, Jesus talks about us trampling on snakes. And then in Revelation, at the end of the Bible, we see uh, the great uh, snake, Satan, being thrown down for all of eternity. Like there is nothing uh, that Satan can do to rob us of our salvation. Jesus is victorious, and we are saved, and we get to be his ambassadors to trample on snakes and scorpions in his name. And this is something to rejoice over for sure. So uh, in closing, we just have three quick application points. Uh, do the good things. <laughs> so this is a phrase also from work camp. Uh, this is a zoomed in uh, part of Ephesians 2.10. Um, and I think it f really fit for work camp. It also fits for us as well. Uh, because we are saved, we have, again, flowing right from that idea of Luke and Acts, we have a mission to do the good things. Uh, we are supposed to rejoice over our salvation first and foremost, uh, but we are supposed to help our neighbors. Uh, and so thank you, everyone, who helped out with work camp. Uh, it was uh, so much work, and it really was a huge team. Uh, church effort actually took um, several different churches, too. And I was just so encouraged to see so many people doing the good things at work camp. So many people stepped up right in the middle of a pandemic, and we had to figure out all those details. Um, but we helped people. Uh, we did good things right in this immediate area. Even some folks right here in Westboro, like literally like five minutes away, we actually helped them. Um, and just to put it on everyone's radar, we're still figuring out a lot of these details, but we really think Work Camp showed us uh, part of our mission here. Like, we really are excited to do more good things. So be on the lookout, uh, check your emails and stuff like that. We're, we're have some, we have some good plans in the works here. So, uh, number two, uh, have the correct motivation. Uh, through today's Bible reading, we saw a lot of people with like bad motivations. Um, they wanted to follow Jesus just because he was popular or it was cool or interesting, especially back then in that culture. Um, like you made a lot of money and you were really a, a really important person uh, if you knew the Bible really well and all that stuff. So we see all these people with these bad motivations. Um, and even with Jesus' own followers, uh, they're getting it, but Jesus is still kind of warning them, have the correct motivation. Keep the joy of your salvation central uh, to your experience and to your mission. Um, we should want to do the right things because we are saved. Uh, and that means uh, that we are saved <laughs> first and foremost. Um, and so I think part of that experience is just admitting that we naturally have bad motivations. Our, our hearts are sinful, and we need to be forgiven. We've all made mistakes because of our hearts are a little bit off. Um, our motivation has to be Holy Spirit-driven. Uh, when, when we ask God to forgive us and we enter into a relationship with Him, uh, and we, we talk about how Jesus died on the cross and He rose again, and we commit our lives to God, the Holy Spirit gives us a new heart, a new motivation. Uh, he really brings us back to life, and our names are perfectly written in heaven. Um, and if we don't have this new life, if our names aren't written in heaven, then we won't have the correct motivation, and we're always going to end up short. So if you want the correct motivation, uh, pray and connect with God. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to give you a new heart. And then lastly, um, rejoice in the midst of pain. Uh, in today's reading, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, he knows he's going to be experiencing intense pain, uh, but he still rejoices. He still takes the time uh, and is able to have that connection with God and with other people, and he just simply rejoices. Um, I don't know what the future holds when it comes to this whole pandemic thing. Um, I know... There's a lot of mystery going on. School has started or is in the process of starting. 
Um, but I want us to remember, just take the time to rejoice in our own salvation. That's going to help us uh, get through the hard times. Uh, and this is not just like uh, positive thinking or naive thinking. It's not just pretending those bad things don't exist. Um, but I want us to have perfect thinking. Think about how we are perfectly forgiven and our names are perfectly written in the book of life. And that will help us get through. Yeah, school is starting up. I know a lot of us, uh, several of us at church have lost loved ones. Some do the virus, some not. I know several of us too are, we have loved ones in the hospital right now, <laughs> and life is hard. Uh, there is pain in this world, uh, but we can still rejoice in the midst of it because we know that God loves us and uh, that he saved us. And we can rejoice because we have a healed heart. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much uh, for calling us and writing our names in heaven. Thank you that you rejoice over us. Thank you that you, <laughs> you, you danced and laughed and... Um, you care about us. We are important to you, and thank you for that. I pray uh, for everyone experiencing, I pray for our nation also experiencing all the pain right now. Um, I don't know what the future is. I don't know what the right answer is. Um, besides that you are the answer for the world today. Uh, we need a new heart. We need you, Holy Spirit. Um, and help us rejoice in all the crazy stuff going on right now. Help us rejoice in our salvation. Help us rejoice in the midst of all the crazy stuff going on right now. Help us rejoice in your salvation. And Holy Spirit, that is something that ultimately that's, that's between you and each person here and each person listening at home. Um, call each people individually. Um, just move them closer to you. Um, use the Bible. Use conversations. Use prayer. Use whatever you want, Holy Spirit. Um, but I just pray that we all are closer to you and that we understand um, just how much you love us and just how great you are, and that we are forgiven and that we have a new life. In your name, amen. So thank you guys uh, for uh, joining us. Um, so yeah, we have um, some closing announcements like we always do. If you want to check out more information, uh, chapelcares.com is where we're at. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. If you want to watch this recording uh, later today, it will be up on our YouTube channel. And thank you so much for supporting uh, chapel and keeping the ministries going like work camp. Um, if you want to give online, you can go to chapelcares.com slash online dash giving. Uh, you can also uh, put the offerings in the back uh, in those offering boxes or just mail it in. Our address is on the screen there. So, so thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, let's just pray. I just want to pray uh, Ephesians 2.10 uh, as the final closing benediction. Uh, Father, thank you so much for everyone here. I pray that we realize that we are God's masterpiece. Thank you for creating us anew in Christ Jesus. Um, we can do the good things that you planned for us to do long ago. I pray that that, that sinks in. Um, help us know that we are made in your image and we have a clear purpose and that you love us. In your name, amen. Thank you, guys. See you at home. <laughs>